Artificial intelligence is taking humans to places we couldn't go before. That's what makes this the age of web. The next question is, where can humans take AI? AI is an ecosystem we all contribute to and benefit from. The next important insight could come from anywhere. And with so much happening so fast, this ecosystem needs a focal point. We created the Global Deloitte AI Institute to answer that need. What role can AI play in my business? How can we use AI in trustworthy and ethical ways? Why isn't there more diversity in the AI workforce? How does my AI career start? And where is AI going next? The Deloitte AI Institute is leading the global conversation on AI. We are connecting businesses, universities, think tanks, policy makers, and startups. We are highlighting today's visionaries, data scientists, and emerging trendsetters. From the boardroom to the college lab, the Deloitte AI Institute is bringing forth insights and using our deep knowledge of all aspects of AI to make sense of this complex ecosystem. Cutting through all the hype, and providing insights to help enterprises make informed AI decisions. I'm Bina Amanad. I'm the Executive Director at the Deloitte AI Institute, where we are not just preparing to meet the AI future, we are shaping it together. Join me online to find out more. Welcome to our session today. My name is Christina Bianic, and I have the pleasure of hosting what I hope will be a really exciting discussion on the AI-fueled organization, with our focus today on energy resources and the industrials industry. By way of background, I serve as our chief commercial officer, and in this role, I really focus on driving growth with our clients and with our partners. And this topic is so relevant across every industry, every client and every alliance partner that we have. And I, as you listen to what Bina just said to us, we are part of this today. This is real, this is now, and we have the opportunity to really shape what this future looks like. I'm joined by two of my colleagues and uh, I'll start with Reed. Would love for you to introduce yourself. <clears throat> Great. Thanks, Christina, and good morning. Uh, thank you for having me, Nitin and Christina, for today. I'm looking forward to this conversation on AI. Certainly, AI is something that is shaping my industry, the energy resource and industrials industry, and shaping some of the innovation that's happening across across all of the sectors. Uh, we are in a we are in an industry that has a ecosystem of different sectors, which include those companies which manufacture things for industrial use those things that power our, our communities and our world, and then finally, those things that protect everything that we do. Um, so very much looking forward to the conversation. There's a lot of disruption happening and, and a lot of opportunity. I'm looking forward to sharing that with you and Nitin. And Reed, I love that you're gonna bring this industry lens to us. And Nitin, I, I left you second because I know that you are all things um, AI. And so <laughs> tell us a little bit about yourself, Nitin. Uh, thank you, uh, Reed, for joining us uh, today. Um, I am uh, Nitin Mithil, and I lead our AI business in the Deloitte US firm. The topic that we're going to be exploring uh, further today on what does it truly mean to be an AI fueled organization is something that we have been conversing on across a multitude of industries. And I'm really happy that we've had the opportunity for Reed to join us today to talk about its application and its impact in energy markets. Love it. So Nitin, I know that we all believe that this discussion is really table stakes. And so before we dive in, I would just remind the audience, you can submit questions throughout the sessions to us and we will do our best to weave those in um, as they come in. So hope that we can make this a lively discussion. But Nitin, I might wanna start with you. You know, I know we have a really strong view that this is table stakes for everybody in the near future. And it's not just the future, it's actually the near future. It's here today, as we saw with Bina's kind of start there. And there's a lot of areas that I know we've defined as to how AI really creates business value. We've got those six areas. And 
we're seeing this. And I thought maybe you could start by just reminding all of us as to how we define the AI fueled organization and maybe a little of what you've witnessed recently at clients across industries. Yeah, no, absolutely. And Christina, I think the key is what you are articulating, which is uh, this is here and now. This is not about the future. This is not about what could happen. This is not about uh, the mid or the long term. This is applicable in our economy as of today, and it is pertinent to every single client, not only whom we serve as Deloitte, but uh, frankly, most of the organizations around the world. If we explore the topic of uh, what does it truly mean to be an AI-fueled organization, AI-fueled organizations are those who actually value data as a factor of production, not just the digital exhaust of applications that are implemented. Data is truly the lifeblood of those organizations. They process that data, they analyze that data, they apply artificial intelligence in every interaction, every workflow, every form of engagement in the course of their business, whether it is with their customers, whether it is with their stakeholders, or whether it is even with their employees. For the purpose of generating insights, for the purpose of creating new experiences, and for the purpose of a whole host of business value that could be brought to bear, whether it is speed to execution, whether it is enabling innovation, whether it is enhancing productivity, whether it is engaging customers, et cetera. So that you are creating new forms of predicting. You are creating new ways of generating insights that could truly be woven into the business decision-making fabric of your organization. And you are creating new ways of engaging customers and fostering their loyalty. It is an approach it is a philosophy and uh, it is a method as opposed to just technology. The key with all of this is that not only are you engaging in new forms with your customers and your stakeholders and your employees, but the information, the insights and the experiences that are generated are also used internally within that organization <clears throat> for you to become a continuous learning organization and not just be static in the part of the economy or the industry that you actually operate in. That's the essence and the heart and soul of what it truly means to be an AI field organization. And Nitin, I, I love the, you know, oftentimes we talk about being data rich and insight poor. And I think in many ways, this is what's going to fuel and unlock that for us and allow for that continuous learning um, and infusion of insights in new ways as you talk to it. So Reed, I know you you obviously yeah. gave a little bit in your intro, spend a lot of time in the ER&I space, and it's sure. a pretty broad industry. Um, so encompassing a lot of discrete sectors, how do you really see AI disrupting the industry? And what AI adoption trends are you already seeing? Sure. No, great, great question. Um, you know, when you really look at across our industry, our industry is unique in the fact that it's an asset intensive industry, right? And so what that means is we've seen a few trends. Um, trend number one, you know, there's a focus on de design and en engineering of the next generation of products. How do we take these, the, this equipment, these products we use day in and day out, uh, put sensors in them, digitize them, and really give them the ability to capture a bunch of information that historically we weren't able to capture. Um, and that includes everything from the equipment we see in factories, aircraft engines, construction equipment, uh, fleet vehicles, the things we use in mines and reservoirs, um, pipelines, refineries, um, generation facilities, and everything uh, that powers our home and gets the power from a generation site to our home. So it's really a uh, unique opportunity. Um, with that comes, uh, and Nitin hit on this a, a little bit, a massive amount of information that we didn't have five or 10 years ago. And the challenge in our industry, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, is how do we get that data from this geographically dispersed set of assets to a place where we can use it, mine it, 
make informed choices, automate things, and ultimately create value for the enterprise. And, and finally, you know, that's, that's really driving sort of a, a number of disruptions in each of the sectors that we serve really across their individual value chain. I think, Reed, you know, there's so much for us to unpack in that. The one thing, Nitin, that I am curious as we think about kind of this expansion of AI, are there, are there concerns that companies have and particularly when we're in more regulated industries and some of the ethical and trustworthiness, do you see certain concerns as people, just as we started that overarching definition of what we're doing before we dive into things, are there things that, you know, we should have top of mind and that you're hearing from clients as concerns? Um, absolutely. <laughs> Which is a question uh, in this uh, field. And uh, frankly, uh, with the scaling up of uh, artificial intelligence, the concerns associated around the applicability of AI is also, uh, I, I would say, kind of front and center of a lot of the discussion that takes place, particularly in the boardroom. I would actually kind of uh, capture the majority of the concerns under one term, and that is trustworthiness. How do we ensure the trustworthiness of AI? The topic of trustworthiness actually includes a number of, uh, I would say, kind of, uh, discussions that are taking place. Discussions around privacy of data, discussions around explainability of the output that is generated by the algorithms, um, discussion around how do we verify the judgment of the algorithms, particularly if they trigger autonomous action, as well as the um, conversations that kind of take place around ethical usage of AI. For example, when is it appropriate to have algorithms in a smart camera versus not? Having mm -hmm. algorithms track basically quality defects and uh, helping to, uh, let's say, enhance productivity in a factory floor is one of the more sophisticated applications of AI. But having the same algorithms in uh, surveillance cameras in public uh, areas may not be that appropriate mm -hmm. in certain societies and certain geographies. So there's always kind of two sides to the coin as it relates to uh, AI. What is key is that as AI is embedded within the fabric of your organization, along with that, there needs to be a governance framework. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a governance framework in terms of how AI is being thought, how is a trustworthiness framework being developed, and how is the discourse and the dialogue taking place around the ethical usages and ethical applications of AI. Example, the uh, manufacturing versus uh, public surveillance that I was kind of uh, outlining. Reed, I'd love if you have any, when you think about your industry in this topic, because I know this is real and we've mm -hmm. certainly talked about this with some clients. So love you to jump in with any, any other thoughts or examples on that as well. Sure. Well, and Nitin hit on smart factory, right? And the use of AI on the factory floor. And that's near and dear to our heart where we continue to invest in smart factory and the innovation in that space. And, you know, just a few examples I would share, you know, as you, as we think about truly automating our factories, there's a couple of business cases and outcomes that really are beneficial. Uh, certainly anything to do with the movement of supply chain, raw materials through warehouses and the factory, um, creates different data than we've had before. Being able to optimize the factory floor, reroute work. Um, really, when you start to look at things such as um, digital twins and whatnot, being able to model changes to the factory floor in advance of actually making those changes so that you can implement them efficiently and know that they're going to have increased uh, efficiencies and outcomes, um, quality inspection, et cetera. So there's a number of opportunities uh, when you look amongst the factory floor, amongst the inbound raw materials, and amongst the outbound products that come out. Reed, I think that's a it's a good pivot because I think in some ways what you're starting to get into also gets into how do you think about the organizations? And so, yeah. you know, how is how is AI really impacting organizations? And if we think about companies and they're facing this challenge of 
we work primarily with scattered physical assets that are disconnected mm -hmm. from digital networks and how how are organizations leveraging AI to solve for this? And I know <laughs> you talk about smart factory, that's certainly at the heart of this, but love for you to share a little bit more about what you're seeing and how organizations are focused on solving for, for that. Yeah, so it's interesting because our um, uh, we see it a lot in our utilities industries, right? Our utilities clients have millions of devices that are scattered over thousands of square miles, right? And we've seen over the course of time that there's been a innovation happening across all of the devices that sort of transmit power from a generating station through transmission lines through the distribution grid into your home. And what that's what's that what's that has resulted in is number one certainly the need for our utility clients to take a step back and understand the capital investment that's required to really undertake that journey. Um, number two, uh, really going out and really either retrofitting, upgrading, or replacing almost every asset on the grid so that they have insights, not only at the meter, but everything from where the power gets generated to that meter. Uh, the, the question in all of that is how does the data or how does all that information go from this broad array of devices back to a centralized location that it can be used? And you know, there's a lot of wireless mesh, wireless mesh networks, proprietary networks, private networks that really are the ability for our, you know, our utility clients to be able to get that information, centralize it, and then be able to make some decisions. How that's impacted the workforce is is a great question because uh, if you look back 10, 15 years ago to do things like start utility service, stop utility service, read a meter all of that required the deployment of resources. And when you look today, all of that happens through the mesh network, through the, through the grid, and directly to the devices so that can control and, and understand if you call and think you have a power problem, they can see if power's working at your meter. So they can give you uh, power, power quality of results, et cetera. Um, when you think about sort of what, what could possibly happen in an outage, it's able to diagnose across the grid and really get very focused on where the grid issues might be relative to that outage, whether it's a broken power line, a tree down, or whatnot, which really helps to prioritize field service work. So it's really changed the way that field service workers are engaged and prioritized in that industry. Reed, I, I think it's fascinating because in many ways you're talking about major process workflow changes mm -hmm. that are results of kind of the AI and automation that's taken place. Yeah. And imagine that that's having large scale, how do we rethink our organization at large and what does it actually mean for us? Absolutely. You know, Nitin, I, I'd be curious as you think about kind of the challenges and maybe some, what what's different as we think about what Reed just walked us through from other, other industries and are there solutions or approaches that ER and I organizations could leverage that we're seeing in other industries um, that could be further along in their AI journeys. When we uh, kind of uh, look at uh, how AI is uh, frankly being scaled across the multitude of uh, industry, what I would say is that there are similarities associated with the pathway to scaling, the pathway to embedding AI, the pathway to fostering trustworthiness and how essentially the investments are being allocated and the programs are being kind of managed and prioritized. There are absolute similarities from industry to industry. Where we do see the difference is the applicability of AI. And the what is the end purpose of the application of AI in a particular industry? Example, in financial services, a lot of the AI work that has been undertaken and frankly, the application of AI has been towards speed to execution. Think of like high frequency trading in uh, financial services, where frankly, at this stage, all <coughs> of the high frequency trading is undertaken by algorithms and sophisticated AI models. Speed to execution is key in financial services. If you go to life sciences, as an example, over there, AI is being applied to enable innovation. 
Think of essentially the COVID-19 pandemic that we have been living under. The fact that in the US, we were able to offer a COVID-19 vaccine 11 months after the COVID-19 virus hit the US shore did not happen by happenstance. It took typically about seven to eight years for a new vaccine to actually come out previous to COVID-19. Now it has taken 11 months. Why? Because AI was actually used to literally decode the genome sequence of the COVID-19 virus. AI was used to design the first diagnostic kit that came out of South Korea. AI was used to digitize and accelerate the clinical trials that were undertaken. And then intelligent automation was used to submit to the various regulatory agencies in US, Europe, and China, the information that was necessary. And then AI was used to enable smart manufacturing techniques to accelerate the production of the actual vials and the production of the vaccines and then ultimately, AI is used by both the WHO as well as various agencies in the uh, distribution of the vaccines. That is an application of how AI is uh, enabling innovation in an industry that used to take a decade or longer to bring out new therapies to us as patients. Similarly, if uh, we talk about the government, government is applying AI to foster trust. Government has to foster trust with its constituents and the citizens in any country, particularly as more and more government services are digitized. If we talk of energy markets and what uh, Reid very eloquently kind of outlined for us, AI is being used in the transition of energy markets. Mm -hmm. How do we model and how do we simulate, for example, solar farms, mm -hmm. wind, uh, uh, kind of turbines where, that capture and harness wind energy, um, even essentially kind of uh, simulate some of the sophisticated equipment that is going uh, into oceans, particularly in uh, your Scandinavian countries, so that you could actually harness ocean currents and turn that into uh, energy that could then essentially kind of power homes. All of that requires the application of AI to model to simulate and ultimately to kind of decide what forms of alternate energy we could be producing, where we could be producing, in what quantity, and the impact that it is actually going to have, have in society. So it's the application that differs, not necessarily kind of the ways and means of how AI is being scaled within a, a particular organization across the industries. So Nitin, it was a, I, I love that application first. Um, thinking and mindset. And you, you're a perfect segue because one of the topics I wanted to get into and talk about was energy delivery safety transition. And so it was a good tee up by you um, on that topic. And, you know, Reed, you know, clearly in the energy and manufacturing sector, infrastructure is built to handle plant maintenance. But yeah. we all know it's those unplanned events and that, that causes that disruption in service or safety concerns that, mm -hmm. you know, those that are not as close to the industry, that's when we really hear and care and think most about this industry. And so, you know, how are you seeing AI play a role in the kind of hardening or dependability, the resiliency of the asset infrastructure? And, you know, in many ways, how are you using AI to kind of keep the lights on? Keep sure. Going? No, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about sort of predictive, you know, predictive maintenance before. But as you think about sort of the data that's being transmitted continuously from all of these assets, um, that data allows for some prediction around asset health, asset failure, right? So there's one dimension of it that that proactively prioritizes work and asset management activities to sort of go after those assets. In addition to that, you were married, we, we're starting to see a trends in the industry where clients are marrying that with other, what I would call other data sources. Um, one very popular is video imaging and how do you do how do you do visual inspection? I'm obviously doing visual inspection in many of these situations um, either covers a lot of geography or could be in risky situations. 
And so in those situations, we see the use of drones and bots and other mechanisms to sort of capture uh, complementary data to the asset that's not necessarily specific to the sensors in the asset itself, but is more from a visual inspection perspective. All of those things come together to really help understand and diagnose where there is potential asset risk or asset failure. And then that translates into how do you prioritize workforce to go after those things that are sort of at the highest risk levels and either do preventative maintenance and or remedi you know, remediation exercises to sort of um, mitigate sort of concerns. Um, one use case we see quite a bit is vegetation management. I think we all know that um, vegetation management sort of continues to grow and and uh, continues to sort of get close to sort of the power lines that uh, that feed our industry, commercial and and homes. And um, you know that's another one that technologies like lidar and whatnot are really helping to. Uh, provide another data source so that we can be ahead of uh, potential issues. So Reed, I'm, I'm gonna ask you a, a bit of a follow-on question to that that came yeah. in from the audience. And it's a question that says like, considering the focus on decarbonization and really reducing emissions across the board, you know, how are you seeing companies utilize AI to achieve that? Um, yeah, well, it's a it's a great question. I think every, all, you know, many of our clients, whether they're in, the ERI industry or in other industries are on a decarbonization journey uh, as part of their ESG responsibilities. Um, you know, there is obviously a lot of data that is getting captured and and centralized related to, um, you know, really carbon emissions, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that number one, it's important for us to get a baseline, right? And so I think the the sensors that we have that can capture carbon emissions will help us set a baseline. Number two, you know, as we think about our abatement options, right, that's a essentially a modeling intensive exercise to really look at the value chain of our clients, whether that's a power generator, an oil company, a industrial products company, um, or whether it's a, you know, a hospital or many of the other industries, right? And really looking across their value chain, looking for abatement opportunities, uh, and then translating that abatement opportunities into modeling, which you can use to prioritize how you go after your abatement exercises and transformation. And this is usually this is usually when I call a lifeline, and you know, so Nitin's my lifeline on all topics like this. So usually I, I, I was going to say, to <laughs> I'm going to first. I love that we got an audience question, so please. Yeah. Um, remember, you can send questions to us, and we are certainly watching. We'll fill those in if we haven't already covered the topic. But Nitin, any anything you would add on that question? Because, I mean, I don't think there isn't an organization that isn't having an ESG kind of at large discussion, and this is so in the heart of that. So, would love your perspective there. Yeah, I'll kind of expand on something that uh, Reed was kind of uh, outlining in terms of. Uh, you know, he talked about sort of abatement and the fact that uh, practically every organization is formulating an ESG, I would say kind of a policy as well as an ESG program. And I had sort of referred to certain examples where AI is actually being used for the purposes of, let's say, modeling and simulating in terms of uh, what type of investments to make in what forms and factors of alternate energy. Another area where AI is uh, frankly being used in a very sophisticated manner is actually within the products itself. What I mean by that is that if you take a wind turbine at this uh, point of time, um, is that, or uh, kind of uh, if you take uh, some of the sophisticated uh, solar panels and uh, the solar panel arrays and farms that are coming up uh, that are basically kind of uh, being built across the world. Those are not just devices or appliances that uh, were manufactured about 10 years back and don't have any level of intelligence in them. What is actually happening today is that algorithms and AI models are actually being embedded in the actual product itself. Wherein, if you have a solar farm if you have uh, a wind uh, uh, sort of windmill or kind of the turbines uh, associated with it, if you have uh, ways of actually kind of capturing carbon 
from the atmosphere and storing it uh, underground, all these are essentially becoming learning systems, wherein a solar farm and the solar panels can actually adjust based on the light conditions in that particular geography. The wind turbines can actually kind of learn the wind patterns in that particular kind of uh, area that they're installed in and optimize the functioning and the output of energy, as well as uh, the power lines that distribute electricity in a smart grid have actual algorithms that are able to kind of figure out the fluctuation of voltage in those uh, particular kind of power lines and prevent any ca catastrophic event or prevent any spikes in energy. That is uh, frankly where AI is actually being embedded in every product, in every process and every form of business that is being undertaken, which is kind of why I say AI is not a technology. AI is essentially a level of intelligence that is produced by inorganic means and is literally being woven right throughout the fabric of our society. And is at the end of the day, is kind of mechanizing what used to be the cognitive ability of humans. And it's interesting. So two, two things come to mind. I know we've created our, what we call our AI dossier that has all, to your point, all those examples of use cases of where AI is just woven into how we will solve business problems. Um, and that's, I, I love the, the dossier. It's something that really got me thinking about and helped help me to understand how we're really mm -hmm. thinking about AI across. And I'll tell you, you might have seen me just take a drink of my water. It was because my smart water bottle was flashing at me. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I was thinking, like, here we are. Data is being collected about my water consumption. And I was not drinking at the pace that I'm supposed to. And is going into somewhere else to feed many other things. And we think about kind of how little parts all feed together when we think about AI just really interwoven into our life and into the products that we use every day um you know one of the things that you said when we were talking about um kind of worker safety so i want to i want to pivot us a little bit when you think about mm -hmm. safety and maybe talk and uh we'll start maybe with you Nitin, and then read mm -hmm. if, any specific applications like how are we seeing organizations really leverage and infuse AI in setting up, whether it's around sustainability or worker safety and how we're using AI to improve kind of the safety of our workforce. Yeah, I can kind of uh, start that and probably uh, perhaps paint a picture across uh, industries. I would uh, actually kind of expand the topic of safety to not only workers, but also let's think about patient safety, mm humor safety and uh, a kind of uh, uh, quality that is expected of the products that are actually kind of manufactured in a variety of uh, industries. If you take the healthcare industry as an example, nurse safety is a topic of discussion. And particularly in uh, the age that <laughs> we're in right now, where hospitals are overwhelmed with the number of uh, COVID-19 patients mm -hmm. who are receiving kind of treatment and particularly the uh, Omicron surge that has kind of taken place. It is a topic that is front and center of uh, the dialogue that takes place amongst hospital administration. AI is being used to model the outbreak and the progression of that outbreak in a particular locality so that the right stuff, the nurse staffing mix can be determined as well as the right precautions can be taken at the appropriate time, as opposed to just kind of hoping and praying and leaving it to hamsters. That is an issue at the heart of nurse safety. If you take consumer safety, and particularly if you take the application of AI and sophisticated algorithms by social media companies, mm -hmm. it is now a foregone conclusion that uh, in many cases it could have a detrimental mental health impact, particularly <laughs> teenagers. How do we actually counteract that? How do we actually retrain those algorithms 
so that they are not addictive, but they are more for the purposes of disseminating information or entertainment or any other forms of engagement of social media, as opposed to actually being addictive. If we kind of uh, take uh, worker safety, uh, worker safety particularly in let's say industrial uh, construction sites, wherein you would typically have let's say a inspection uh, that uh, needs to be undertaken in a ha hazardous uh, area and you would actually send a human inspector with a hard hat to that particular area mm -hmm. and and there have been many kind of accidents that end up uh, taking place mm -hmm. today to the point that reed actually made earlier you can fly a drone mm -hmm. that drone is not a dumb drone that drone essentially has a smart camera that not only is capturing video um, and images, but has algorithms embedded in the camera itself that can actually analyze the construction site. Similarly, companies like uh, Austin uh, Dynamics, uh, um, as an example, have uh, or uh, <clears throat> have kind of like, uh, let's say, pioneered robots that uh, would be able to go into construction site and do a visual inspection that typically used to be the prerogative of a human inspector. All those are ways and forms of how safety is front and center across a multitude of industries, whether it happens to be industrial construction sites, healthcare, consumer companies, social media companies, etc. Love it. So we got a question from the audience that actually aligns with, I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time thinking about the future direction. Mm -hmm. And the question that came in from the audience is, are there any disadvantages or cons in implementing AI in ER and I? And I think, you know, we, we've talked about challenges to deploying AI yeah. um, and opportunities for an impact on sustainability. So where do you think AI mm -hmm. is going to kind of make the biggest impact over the next three to five years? And maybe as you talk about that, maybe spend a few minutes to acknowledge what some of those challenges that I would say we have to overcome, you know, as this, as somebody in the audience said, like the disadvantages or cons, but really thinking about how do we overcome those and where do we think there's going to be the biggest impact in ER and I over the next three to five years? Sure. No, great question. So, I, you know, I think when you think about the future, there's, there's some of the AI uh, innovation that we've talked about today that is just starting to impact our industry. So one that I'm pretty excited about, Digital Twin. Um, you know, we see Digital Twin, you know, at the, what I would call at the part level and at the device level and at the equipment level. Um, but what you see in other industries where they're embracing Digital Twin at the factory level or smart city level. Um, and then obviously there's the, the discussion around metaverse and I'm sure Nitin could uh, speak to us for hours on that topic. You know, but I think the idea of digital twin and how we use that in terms of um, advancing our capabilities, enabling the workforce, doing AR, VR, helping with training, really will start to take shape in terms of how we transform everything from factories to power to ESG and the workforces that work across that. So I'm pretty excited about that trajectory and how that's just going to be a game changer for how we enable and activate the workforce. Um, you know, so that would be that would be number one. I think some of the challenges as you've hit on, you know, I think there's really a couple. Number one, the, the geographic element of our industry is complicated, right? Whether it's mm -hmm. offshore, offshore drilling rigs, whether it's sort of all these broad, uh, you know, as we go from fairly centralized generation sources to now generation sources that are wind farms, solar farms, um, that obviously has some complexity. Uh, when you look at the power grid, um, you know, as we're on this journey for more renewable energy, one desire for renewable towards renewable energy is adopting microgrids, distributed energy management systems, um, and really having more decentralized generation capabilities. And when you do that, that really requires you to retro upfit sort of the, or evolve the entire power grid. The power grid's predominantly one directional. Uh, it requires it to be bi-directional, right? And there's a ton of, comp you know, complications in that, both from a technology perspective and business models and whatnot. So there's uh, a number of changes there. Um, you know, and then we have to acknowledge there's some of our industries in ERNI are 
regulated, right? And when there's a regulated component to them, um, you know, be, before you can make that capital investment, you've got to make sure that you've got appropriate, you know, legislative sign off and approval and it's built into rate cases. And, you know, there's a lot of complexity in that as well. So um, I, I don't see any use cases that are um, disadvantageous to ERNI, um, but I do see those that have complexities uh, in terms of how fast we can adopt them and, and embrace them. You, you know, Reed, when I think about what you're talking about in the journey, how do we, we got a question that said, how can we really prepare our organizations? And the question was really asking about like the digestion, like all the information and how, you know, how insights are derived is going to change. I, I would ask you and Nitin as well, like how are we preparing as you think, Reed, in the ways that we're working with our clients right now to really expand how we're innovating and kind of ER and I throughout and how are we preparing organizations and what, what should they be thinking about, you know, as we think about not just here today, but this future direction? Yeah, it's a, it's interesting because it'd be, um, you know, we see a, a, a number of clients sort of embracing things at a various pace, right? So I think, you know, the good news is many are starting to get started, right? So I think get started, establish a small effort to really learn about AI. And so we, we have clients who are embracing smart factory. They're doing that in a very controlled way so that they can you know, understand and apply the learnings uh, and use that to inform future business cases for smart factory innovation more broadly across their client base. Um, we have, we have clients who are doing things like conversational AI and whatnot, which are embracing it to really activate different parts of their call centers and whatnot and how they engage with their customers, um, but doing it in a measured way. Um, but then we do have clients who are pioneers uh, and innovators for their industry, and they're taking large scale uh, sort of end to end AI, everything from really modernizing the grid in totality to having all the infrastructure to get the data from that grid and really transforming how they're going to run the power grid going forward in a differentiated way and really activate the ability to implement, you know, more decentralized generation sources into the grid going forward, which which has a number of benefits as we think about EV charging networks and all the infrastructure that's needed to do that well. And the benefit of EV charging networks and our ability to, you know, really pivot from, you know, carbon based automobiles and whatnot to more EVs in the future. It's it's definitely a bright future for us, Reed. So you said something about the pioneering. And so Nit and I'm gonna come to you. I know we're closing out our time here. So I, I want to ask you, just uh, if you look across all industries, you know, and you thought about like, in what ways will AI have the greatest transformative impact and why? And I realize you could go on for hours on this. Now. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to contain that <laughs> to our time here, but would, would love your perspective on just greatest transformative impact and where, where you see that. The greatest impact would be where every entity, every organization, every process, and every form of interaction becomes a learning mechanism. We as human beings have cognitive ability, and because of that cognitive ability, the more we are exposed, the more that we actually absorb, and the more that we experience, we learn. And because we learn, we improve, and we innovate. That same philosophy is now permeating to organizations, processes, ecosystems, and systems. Wherein, because of artificial intelligence, these organizations are developing human-like cognitive ability. The more data that is fed to them through the environment, the same way that data is absorbed through our eyes and ears, and touch and smell, these organizations will be able to absorb that data, digest that data, process that data, manufacture intelligence, and learn from that intelligence and become better and better and better, similar to us as humans. So Din, I love it. It definitely leaves me inspired for um, kind of a better world ahead. Listen, thank you both, Reed, Nitin. Your insights were outstanding. And to our audience for the questions that you sent to us. And as always, please visit the Deloitte AI Institute um, if you'd like to learn more about our perspectives and the AI-fueled organization. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you.
Artificial intelligence is taking humans to places we couldn't go before. That's what makes this the age of web. The next question is, where can humans take AI? AI is an ecosystem we all contribute to and benefit from. The next important insight could come from anywhere. And with so much happening so fast, this ecosystem needs a focal point. We created the Global Deloitte AI Institute to answer that need. What role can AI play in my business? How can we use AI in trustworthy and ethical ways? Why isn't there more diversity in the AI workforce? How does my AI career start? And where is AI going next? The Deloitte AI Institute is leading the global conversation on AI. We are connecting businesses, universities, think tanks, policy makers, and startups. We are highlighting today's visionaries, data scientists, and emerging trendsetters. From the boardroom to the college lab, the Deloitte AI Institute is bringing forth insights and using our deep knowledge of all aspects of AI to make sense of this complex ecosystem, cutting through all the hype and providing insights to help enterprises make informed AI decisions. I'm Bina Amanat. I'm the Executive Director at the Deloitte AI Institute, where we are not just preparing to meet the AI future, we are shaping it together. Join me online to find out more. Thank you.